So this floats on air bearings, this whole saddle floats on air bearing, the cross light floats on air bearing, the main spindle and the grinding spindle are all on air bearings. Hi, I'm Adam. This is the Machine Tech video blog, and today I'd like to talk about air bearings. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I came across Dan Gelbart's video in which he discusses his scratch-built, high-precision, air-bearing CNC lathe and grinder, and I was pretty impressed, as I'm sure were the other hundreds of thousands of people who watched that video. If you haven't watched it yet, hit the pause button and go do that thing. It's okay, I'll be here when you get back. Did you watch it? Pretty cool, right? I mean, it's not a novel concept. Similar machine tools are often used in ultra-high precision machining applications like diamond turning or grinding optical components. And of course there's the coordinate measuring machine, which at this point is a common fixture in the modern machine shop. These machines can achieve their high positional accuracy in large part because they ride on air bearings and granite guideways. The moving components are floating on a thin, stiff cushion of air with smooth, near frictionless motion over super flat surfaces. There's no wear, no pesky stick slip effects, and no lubricants to contain. With all that's good about air bearings, it's a little bit of a puzzle as to why we don't use them more often than we do. There are some inherent load capacity and stiffness limitations with air bearing technology. But the main reasons that it's remained in a niche are the challenges of designing and manufacturing components which require extremely tight dimensional and form tolerances. Flatness, roundness, sphericity. So what's inspiring about Dan Gelbart's video is that he actually makes you believe that you too could construct your very own ultra high precision machine tool just by gluing some granite together, whipping up some air bearings and scouring eBay for surplus spindles. Obviously, designing and manufacturing such a machine is a little more complicated than that, and you'd spend many thousands of dollars in materials alone. Still, I think the project would be fun and potentially illuminating, but you'd probably have to make a miniaturized version, and you'd have to try to make as many of the components as possible yourself. The way I see it, there are three keystone technologies which you would need to research and develop in order to determine whether building a DIY ultra high precision lathe in a small shop environment is even feasible. One, the granite guideways. Two, the air bearings for the longitudinal and transverse axes. And three, the air bearing spindle. Here are a few solutions I'd like to test out myself. By the way, there are links in the description to all of the resources I'm about to mention. First, there are the granite guideways. You could use granite parallels with four finished faces, but they're pretty expensive. An alternative, at least for the longitudinal guideways, is to buy one of these 6 inch wide by 18 inch long by 2 inch thick granite surface plates from Wood River. Only one face is finished, but it turns out that grinding and lapping granite is surprisingly straightforward, so you could finish the other three faces yourself. Tom Lipton from Ox Tools has some very helpful videos on the lapping process in general, and Robin Renzetti has some videos on lapping granite surface plates specifically. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to grind and lap these guideways myself. Then there are the air bearings to support the axes. Air bearings are commercially available from several companies like Newway and OAV, but they're also expensive, especially for what they are. I mean, it should be easy to make your own, but although there's a lot of information about how to use air bearings, there's very, very little information about how to actually make them. It doesn't help that the math which describes the behavior of thin films of pressurized gas squeezed between two surfaces involves nonlinear differential equations. It's actually kind of challenging to predict the real performance characteristics of air bearing designs without sophisticated finite element analysis software. 
Luckily, David Price recently came out with a video on DIY air bearings using Sinker EDM electrodes made out of graphite, and it really helps to demystify the design and manufacturing process. In the next few videos, I'd like to further develop this process for real-world machine tool applications. But before that, let's talk about the air bearing spindle. Most of the surplus spindles on the used market come from the semiconductor industry. They're used predominantly for scanning and for drilling and grinding small features. So they're designed for high speeds and light loads, and they work with small collet systems. An appropriate spindle for our application would be designed for moderate speeds and loads, and you would need to mount a chuck on it. One good option is the Professional Instruments Blockhead Spindle, but even a used unit goes for around $1,000. Now, recently I came across a wonderful technical article authored by the Oak Ridge Y12 plant in 1974, which details the design and manufacture of a self-aligning machine tool spindle constructed from two opposed spherical graphite air bearings. Serendipitously, Ben Krasno of Applied Science also recently came out with a video about DIY graphite air bearings, in which he demonstrates a simple and effective way to form or shape graphite for non-planar bearing geometries using the bearing elements themselves. A spindle based on the Oak Ridge design, which incorporates Ben Krasno's innovative technique, definitely seems doable, and making one is something I'd like to attempt. Let's take a step back. Like all bearings, air bearings can be designed to support radial loads, axial loads, or some combination of the two. Regardless of the type of load they're designed to support, all air bearings work by forcing pressurized air into a narrow gap between two surfaces. There are two categories, aerodynamic and aerostatic, with the difference being how air is introduced into the gap. Aerodynamic bearings rely on relative motion between the surfaces to generate a pressure gradient. Here's an aerodynamic thrust bearing I made, which demonstrates the principle. It's based off a similar model shown in a video by Dave Arneson from Professional Instruments. The bearing surfaces are the disc face and the three tilting pad surfaces. When the disc is rotating, it drags the air around and jams it into the gap between the disc and the pads. The surfaces are completely separated and the disc is supported by a cushion of air. It's easy to prove this using the continuity testing feature on a multimeter. When the disc is at rest, the surfaces are touching and the electrical circuit between the stationary components and the rotating components is closed. But when the disc is rotating, the surfaces are not touching at all, and so the electrical circuit is open. Notice that as the disc slows down, it begins to make intermittent contact with the pads until at last it comes to a full stop and the electrical circuit is closed again. <laughs> you know, it's actually kind of hard to describe how satisfying this device is as a fidget toy. Maybe if there's sufficient interest, I'll make a separate video on how exactly this bearing works and how I made it. Aerostatic bearings use an external source to pump pressurized air directly into the gap, which then flows outward across the surfaces to the edges and escapes to ambient pressure in the environment. They're ideal for linear motion applications because their ability to support loads is not sensitive to surface speeds, and they have full performance even at zero speed. Flat bearings are used to support axial loads, that is, loads perpendicular to their flat faces. Aerostatic bearings can further be split into two categories, orifice and porous media. The difference, again, comes down to how air is introduced into the gap. Orifice designs are the simplest. It's really just one or more tiny pinholes, sometimes with pockets or grooves, drilled through a flat surface into an air chamber. But it turns out that the correct orifice size is really critical to proper performance, really difficult to predict, and really sensitive to manufacturing tolerances. It's a sort of nightmarish engineering trifecta. If you get it wrong, the air flow rate through the gap will be too high, and the air bearing will vibrate and hum due to a kind of instability called pneumatic hammer. Here's a particularly poorly designed bearing with a way oversized orifice. And this is what it sounds like. Yucky. Porous media designs accomplish the same task by forcing the air through a labyrinth of tiny passageways or pores to create a uniform blanket of air at the bearing face. 
Graphite is the medium of choice because it has the added benefits of being easy to machine and having good natural lubricity. So it won't damage the guideways in the event of a loss of pressure. This type of bearing is still susceptible to pneumatic hammer if the pore size isn't just right. But there's an easy way to correct for this, which I'll show you later. Here's the plan for the next few videos. First, I'll start by making a flat aerostatic graphite bearing with a versatile modular design. This involves machining the aluminum body and the graphite insert, anodizing the body, epoxying the two components together, lapping the bearing surface, and then fine-tuning the flow rate. Then I'll subject the bearing to a barrage of scientific experiments in order to ascertain its performance characteristics. Finally, I'll attempt to generalize the results from these tests and develop a simple, empirically derived design methodology which can be applied to any application. Anyway, that's it for this video. Stay tuned for part two, and of course, I hope you learned something.